In this video, I want to show you Farkash Lemma, um, why it holds, and how to prove strong reality with it. The proofs, however, I will only sketch. So what's Farkash Lemma? So let's first start with some geometric intuition. So and for that, I will need the concept of a convex cone. So I'm in R to the M, and I have N vectors, A, I, and the cone, the convex cone spanned by these vectors, C, is simply any linear combinations uh, with non-negative coefficients. And we can then also write this as Ax, x larger equal zero, and you might already see how this is connected to linear programming. So in 2D, this would look like this here. In 3D, you can also imagine how such a cone would look like. So it's a cone generated by the columns of A, if I look at this in terms of uh, a matrix A. Now, Ax equals B has a solution, if and only if B lives inside of this cone. So now we have a B in this cone. And yeah, for A, Ax to be B, it means that B is in C. And that, of course, assuming x larger equals zero. Farkash lemma now gives us a characterization of the situation if B is not in the cone. So the geometric interpretation here is that if B is not in the cone, so like this B over here, then I can actually find a separating hyperplane which separates the cone from B in the sense that the cone is on one side of the hyperplane and possibly on the hyperplane, and B is on the other side. And a hyperplane, so here I have this hyperplane, has this vector y transposed, if y is the normal to the hat hyperplane. So on the hyperplane I have y transposed, x is zero, and then c, for c, I, for having anything in c, I have y transposed, x larger equals zero, and for b, small. And that's exactly Farkas' lemma. So let's now look at it in terms of matrices. So I have a matrix A, it's an M times N matrix, B is an R to the M, then we have exactly one of the two possibilities. Either there is an X such that AX equals B, so this is the case B is in the cone with X larger equals zero, or, so if B is not in the cone, there is a Y, so this is the normal vector for this hyperplane, such that Y transposed A is larger equal zero and, and this is now a vector of zeros and y transpose b is smaller zero so b is on the other side this is farkash lemma we're not going to prove it but let me give you some idea of how one would prove it so what we would do is the following so here we have c and b and let's assume b is outside of c and then I'm going to take Z, which is the closest point in C to B. And I'm going to consider this vector Y, which is Z minus B. So simply if I go from the tip of B to Z, that is Z minus B. And I'm going to define Y as exactly that. So here you see Y again. And what we would now need to prove is, first of all, I was assuming we have this z here, the closest point, so we have to prove that such a closest point actually exists. And then we would have to prove that with this choice of y, c, the cone is on one side, b is on the other side, so y transposed b should be smaller zero, that is actually the easier part of the proof. And on the other hand, we want to have y transposed x is larger or equal zero for every any x in the cone. So in my example, this is the case, so this y, which comes from here, gives me this hyperplane, or just here in 2D aligned, and c is on one side, b is on the other. This is all I wanted to say about the proof of Farkas lemma. So let's now assume Farkas lemma holds, and we want to prove strong reality. 
we will need a variant of Farquhar's lemma for that, and that is the following. So instead of having equality here, we want to be working with inequalities. So this variant now states Ax smaller equal b has a non negative solution x if and only if for every non negative y such that y transpose a larger equal zero. So this is again, think of this as taking a hyperplane, y being the normal vector, a, and the cone is on one side. Then also y transpose b has to be on the same side. This is actually the same as Farquhar's lemma with one difference. We have the non-negative here. So without the non-negative, this would be Farquhar's lemma, but then with equality here. Now with small equal here, this gets stronger. We have non-negativity. So stated differently, if B does not lie in the cone, then I can find a non-negative Y separating B and A, or B and the cone C. Let's again look at this geometrically. So A x smaller equal b as a solution. We can interpret this in the following way. So a x is again my cone c and smaller equal b as a solution means there should be a b prime, let's say this one, which is in the cone, but which is also dominated by b in the sense that it's if seen from b in the negative octant, or I can go from b there by just using a negative a vector which is negative or non-positive in all of its coordinates. If I look at this instead of looking from b, looking at this from b prime, it means that I can reach b from b prime with a vector which only has non-negative coefficients or stated differently. B lies in the cone, which I now call C plus, spent by the AIs, so this is my green cone, and additionally by the standard basis. Okay, so this means that I can reach B from, and this combination now, first, if I first use the A vector, this brings me to some position in the cone, B prime, and then the standard vectors allow me to add a vector with non-negative coefficients to go to B. But now this condition that B has to lie in the cone C plus, I can, using Farkas lemma, reinterpret or get from this that this is equivalent to that C plus and B cannot be separated by a hyperplane to zero. And this in turn means that C and B cannot be separated by a hyperplane to zero where the standard basis is on the side of C, from which the variant, our variant of Farkas lemma follows, at least geometrically. So now let's do this in terms of matrices, but the proof will be essentially the same as we just saw. For the proof, we start with Ax small equal b and essentially do the same as if we would be adding slack variables to get equational form. So if we add slack variables to get equational form, we change our matrix A to a matrix where we additionally have here a matrix with the ones on the diagonal and zeros above and below for the slack variables. So now we have that Ax small equal b if and has a non-negative solution if and only if the system with slack variables, so this is A bar x bar equals b uh, has a non-negative solution. But to this one, we can now apply Farkas lemma. And Farkas lemma tells, it tells me that this has a non-negative solution if and only if for every y in r to the m, y transposed a bar larger equals zero, and this is now the zero vector, if any y for which this holds, we also have that y transpose b larger or equal to zero. So this is simply Farkas lemma. And we can decompose this into two parts. This for on the one side tells me that for such a y that y transpose a is larger or equal to zero, 
but this also tells me that the y is non-negative, which is exactly what we needed in this variant of Hakash Lemma. Now let's see how we can come from this variant of Hakash Lemma to strong duality. Once more, strong duality states that if I have optimal solutions for the primal and the dual program, then I have equality here between C transposed X star, so for the primal, and B transposed Y star. And the proof starts with two actually trivial observations, namely the following. So if I have my constraints from the primal, AX mod equal B, and as additional constraint, I take C transposed X should be larger or equal C transposed X star. So X star being the optimal solution, which for the sake of the proof, I assume I know here. Then this has a non-negative solution X. And this is trivially true because X star itself is a solution to, uh, that fulfills both of these constraints. But if I add a plus epsilon here, so now I have AX mod equal B, but now I'm asking for C transpose X larger equal C transpose X star plus epsilon, then this does not have a solution for any epsilon larger than zero, because if that would be the case, so if there would be a solution, that solution would be more optimal than X star. I can write this as a linear program, each of these. So let, let's first take the second one here. I can write as a linear program with smaller equal. What I would need there is I'm essentially writing this, these constraints below those constraints. And then as a matrix, I get the A here. And then because I have to get this to you know, this one here to the other side, I get a minus C transpose. And then my B vector, my bound is B up here. The B comes from here. And then this again has to go to the other side. I get um, this part in the lower half of my new B. And this works, so this was now for the second one, but if I set epsilon to zero, it is the same for the first one. And what we now have, therefore, is that a hat x, small a equal b hat zero, has a solution, while this one, for any epsilon larger than zero, does not have a solution. So this having no solution, I can follow from the Farkas lemma, or conclude from Farkas lemma, or the variant of Farkas lemma, actually, that since this has no solution, there is a non-negative y hat, so this was this normal vector for this hyperplane, separating the cone corresponding to A, or generated by the columns of A hat, from B epsilon hat. So there is this y hat, such that y hat transposed A hat is larger or equal zero, the zero vector, and y hat transposed B epsilon hat is smaller. But since this linear program has a solution, if I take the same vector y or y hat, for that one I actually do not get smaller zero here because I have a solution, so I cannot separate the cone from the b or stated differently, I have that b hat t b zero hat has to be also larger or equal zero for this y hat. Okay, so let's now start a fresh slide with all of this on it. So we have our a hat, we have the b epsilon hat, and we have found a y hat, or we know a y hat exists, with y hat transpose a hat large equals zero. If I plug in b epsilon hat here, I get smaller zero, but with b zero, I get a larger equal zero. Now let's rewrite this, and for that I'm taking my y hat and I write it in the form uz. So y hat is, uh, is m plus one dimensional. So now u is an m dimensional vector, z is just a number. So rewriting it like this, if I look at this first um, set of inequalities, what this uh, is, is that u transpose a, I have the a here for the a hat, minus, and then I have z times c transpose. This is large equal zero, so this condition rewrites like that. And from that I can follow that 
u transpose a larger equal z times c transpose. Now if I define v as being u divided by z, so I take the divide by z here, bring, get it here, then I have that this here, so this v is a feasible solution to my dual program. This only works if I can actually divide by z, so for that it shouldn't be zero. So from the moment, let's assume z is larger than zero. So if z is larger than zero, this gives me a feasible solution to the dual problem. Now let's continue with the next set of inequalities here, rewriting that in terms of u and z. I get that b transposed u, which is the same as u transposed b, is now smaller than z times, and then what I had here, I mean, the minus I already got out by bringing it to the right-hand side. So this means if I again divide by z, I have here that b transposed v is smaller c transposed x star plus epsilon for any epsilon. And again, this only works if z is not zero. Um, so that we still need to establish that z is not zero. We can get this from the third set of inequalities here, because this tells me that so b transpose u, which is the same as u transpose b, is larger or equal, and then I again take the z part, bring it to the right hand side, larger we get z times c transpose x star. From that, I can conclude that so this term is smaller equal that term, which is smaller than that term here. So I have z times this is smaller than z times that. This can only be the case if z is non-zero. So z has to be positive. But now I have these two conditions fulfilled, which means I indeed have a feasible solution or v, the v that I found here is a feasible solution to the dual program, which additionally has a property that it is smaller than the optimum of the primer plus epsilon, but I can make epsilon arbitrarily smaller. From this, I can conclude that for the optimal solution for the dual program, which is at most as large as this v, that this solution is smaller than c transpose x star plus epsilon for any epsilon. But since this holds for any epsilon, this actually holds with equality. And this concludes the video on Farkas Lemma and how to prove strong reality using Farkas Lemma.